Hey guys, Carlo Filippo in here, your muscle chef, ready to talk to you about this guy, the chicken pound. What do we do with the chicken pound? We prepare grilled chicken in different flavors, six to be exact. If you're serious about bodybuilding and you meal prep, don't go anywhere else. This is the company for you. RX Television on RXMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition, Titan Medical, and The Chicken Pound. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. This is your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions, of course, the Olympia. Two and a half weeks, hard to believe, but only two and a half weeks away uh, and, of course, Chemical Warfare sponsoring our coverage of the 2019 Mr. Olympia. As we now bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, we just wrapped up on another batch of interviews uh, with Juan Morel, Brandon Hendrickson, and you just wrapped with Chris Bumstead. So we're going to be unleashing a whole onslaught of pre-Olympia interviews, all part of our 2019 Iron Road to the Olympia. Did you book your flight, Sid? Oh, New York. Yes, I did. <laughs> and you bought it with the hotel. Did you book that? Yes, I did. All right. I'm just checking. So we're good. Flight and hotel were all, <laughs> all sorted. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, what I try to do when I look, everyone knows, you know, a lot of these competitors and I've interviewed them before. So when I get these guys on the show, I try to find an angle on each one of them that's something unique. Like with Juan, you know, Juan's known for his eating, you know, his eating prowess. So I wanted to talk about how his eating has evolved over the years because he used to have to eat everything in sight 12 times a day, you know. Now he's, that he's got a little older, his metabolism has slowed down and it's actually worked to his advantage because he could put muscle on and he doesn't have to quite eat as much food, you know, to keep up with, uh, with it. So, you know, every, every competitor I took a different angle on it and, and I think there's some funny stuff in there, there's some touching, emotionally touching stuff in there um, and that's how I approached it and I think that the interviews are, are really potent so far. So. I think people are gonna like it. Obviously, the Jay Cutler uh, interview has been super popular. Part two by the, will probably be up by the time people watch this. And uh, you know, Jay really gave me a great interview, even though he didn't give me one last year because there was whatever was going on. This year, he more than made up for it. I think we had to, we touched on some pretty potent topics. So I'm pretty happy so far with the with the Iron Road to the Olympia. So by the time this episode's air, part two of the Jay Cutler interview will be live. Uh, on rxmuscle.com and the Rx Muscle YouTube channel. Let's go to the questions. The first two questions from the Dave Lumbo Experience app. Uh, Dave, did you make your rotational diet when you completed when you competed, or is it something you recommend to your clients? And if you did, how many days are no carbs? How many are with carbs? Uh, from your own experience. You know, I was toward the end of my career. I was very intuitive with my diet, meaning that I would go no carbs, protein and fat for several days in a row until I felt I was too depleted and I wasn't getting a pump in the gym and I felt like maybe I, my weight was dropping too much on the scale and then I would put some carbs back in and I would do carb, you know, I would add carb days. And that's really how I, 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 I worked it most of my career. Toward the very, very end, I found that, you know, my metabolism was so good and I stayed so lean because I really, what I would do, the last three years of my career, I never tried to get heavy in the off season. I, before that, I always went over 300 pounds. I said, you know what, I don't need to be this big anymore. I'm in my 30s, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with 285. So I stayed at 285 and then I would come down, you know, 18 pounds or so, whatever, to compete. And um, what I found was that, you know, because I never got fat, I had to actually feed my metabolism. So while I still never ate a very, I never ate a super high carb diet, I would eat McDonald's once a day, okay? which probably has more fat and protein in it than it does carbs. Because what are the carbs in McDonald's burgers and fries? The fries, which are, I mean, they don't really give you a lot of fries. You know, there's probably more grease and, and oil in the fries than anything. And then the, the burgers are all protein and fat, except for the buns, which are maybe, you know, a couple, you know, I don't know, 30 grams of carbs, 40 grams of carbs maybe. So I wasn't eating an exorbitant amount of carbs every day. And probably my carb intake was still under 200 grams per day. So. Even when I ate carbs, I didn't eat a lot. But what, when I work with clients, what I do is I have rotation days where some days are protein and vegetables and carbs, like clean carbs, and then other days are just protein and fat. And then what I do is as they 
as they get closer to the show, if they're not losing weight, I eliminate the carb days and I, and I have them on more of just the protein days and fat days with zero carbs. So, but everyone's different. So it, it's impossible for me to give you like a formula. It's, you got to go by trial and error. And that's what I did with myself by the mirror, how they look. If I have a client who lost five pounds in three days and they're, you know, they're in the middle of their prep, which it shouldn't, ha- you know, maybe in the beginning of the prep it'll happen, but not in the middle of the prep, then I know that they got to be fed. You know, likewise, if, if they're on some, if I'm feeding them carb days and they're not losing any weight, I know I got to cut, cut some of those carbs out. Sometimes I won't take them completely out. I'll just, I'll keep them on those days, but I'll cut the carb content down, maybe even half. But that's trial and error. And that's where the coach, your coaching finesse comes in knowing when to take calories out or put them in. Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Good one here. What other bodybuilders in the 90s now, if you want to answer someone else outside of the 90s era, what other bodybuilders in the 90s era trained like Dorian? And then he goes on to ask, why do most bodybuilders do high volume? You know, I think in the 90s, everyone was training like Dorian. Even the people who might have gone back to high volume because they were volume trainers, everyone said, Dorian's big, we got to train like this. And I, there was, so there was a lot of bodybuilders that were training with, with lower volume, maybe not the extent of Dorian. I never went as low as Dorian went, but I, my volume was way cut back, and, and I found that it worked really well for my physique uh, when I did that. But then there's always guys that just are volume guys. Now, you know, I was talking to this guy who does DNA testing, and he was telling me that there are certain, you know, enzyme systems that people have that are, just make them more, and, and gene, you know, expression um, proteins that just make them more uh, able to train longer. They, they, can, they just have the ability to recover with long training. Supposedly, Ronnie Coleman has that, that gene. That this, I forget what the name of the gene is, where you can just train more frequently with, with high intensity and even more volume, and, and you can recover. I certainly don't have that. You put me in the gym too long, and I disappear. It's like my muscles, I can continue to go, I'll continue to train, I won't stop, but I'll get, we- I'll get weaker, and I'll get smaller. And that's just my metabolic rate. So I, it's really a blessing. People think it's not, it's not a curse, because I can do less and get more out of it. And I think that that's more efficient, really. So, you know, it, every, like I said, everyone's a little different. Let's go to our Instagram questions. If you're not following us, our handle is official underscore RX muscle. And as we've been doing uh, during this Iron Road to the Olympia, the run up to the 2019 Olympia, and of course, during Olympia weekend, we are loading up our feed, our stories with the content that we're putting up on RXMuscle.com and the YouTube channel, as well as keeping you up to date with the latest progress pictures from some of the top competitors in the different divisions. And then, of course, that weekend, we are going to be loading up the Instagram story, the feed, whatever, whoever you run into, whatever cool things are going on, Olympia weekend, that's going to be documented. Again, official underscore RX muscle. Let's go to Lane Hughes, huge fan of the show. What's the lowest amount of trend uh, and that I could run with 600 mg testy and 400 mg uh, and avoid the sides but still gain? You know, you'd be shocked at how potent trenbolone as a drug is. I challenge you, okay, I challenge you to use very small amounts of it and tell me you don't get results. People think because everyone's on, you know, five, 600 milligrams a week, which is ridiculous, that they have to do that. Do 50 milligrams of trend and anthate twice a week. I'll get, or do, if you want to really go crazy, do 100 milligrams, you know, or do 150 milligrams per week. 75 and 75. That's what we did back in the day. Parabone was 76 milligrams. You took two ampules a week. Try that. I guarantee you get good results on it, and I bet you don't have this negative side effects. When we took Parabone back in the day, they came in these little amps. They were a cc and a half, and the cc and a half contained 76 milligrams of Trembolone. Uh, I think it was a Nathate or one of the other longer-acting ones. Um, I can't remember the name of the, uh, the ester, but it was a long-acting ester. And you would take two of these, and, and everyone said, don't do more than two, okay? And if you wanted to get a little risky, you'd do three of them, you know, like right before a show, maybe the last two weeks. But I'm telling you, I never had a negative side effect from it, okay, ever. All I got was positives, and, I, and, and it worked. So obviously the drug is potent enough. I think people are just taking too freaking much of it, and because they're taking too much of it, they're getting hyperlactin levels, and they're getting the side effects. I never heard anyone in the 90s report of sex drive or inability to get an erection from taking Trenbolone. It just didn't happen. 
because no one took that much of it. It's deathly dose related. Absolutely no doubt about it. Interesting question here about, uh, from Uncore 497. It's about Branch Warren. Had Branch Warren trained with, quote, sanity and full range of motion, what do you think would have been the difference in his physique? Knowing Branch, he probably wouldn't have looked like Branch. <laughs> I think for his body, it worked. Let me tell you a good story about my good friend Jimmy Pelletier. Jimmy Pelletier, when I first met him and I saw him in the gym, I thought he was out of his fucking mind. He was, first of all, he was the scary, he, everyone's like, don't talk to him when he's training, because he would scream, huh, 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 you know, and he would do these short reps with ridiculous amounts of weight on the bar. He would break bars in the gym, he would bend bars, he would, I mean, he was, he was like, gym owners didn't want him in the gym. And you would think there's no way you can build muscle with what he was doing. All momentum type stuff, but it hit, he figured out a system the way it worked, and it worked for his body. And his body grew, he was enormous, okay? But if the normal person tried to do that, they probably would've killed themselves. But I knew a guy, he was just a regular guy, he used to own a strip club. He used to train with Jimmy every day. Jimmy really got up to spot him. But he, he taught, Jimmy taught him the system. And this guy was doing the same crazy stuff as Jimmy, and he was, he was actually responding to it. So um, there is a system behind what Branch Warren does, it's just, branches system and if you try to do it and you don't know what you're doing you'll get very hurt um so that's why branch grew doing that now if branch trained conventionally i don't know maybe he would have looked the same maybe he wouldn't have i really don't maybe he wouldn't have torn as many muscles but what branch did worked for him and that's why it was you know the right thing so you can't say what if he would have done this or would have done that because he didn't that's not how he trained we have a ton of questions. Let's see how many we can get through. Caustic Demir, does eating large amounts of protein make you go to the bathroom more? He says specifically to pee. I eat around 300 grams protein per day and drink uh, upwards of three liters of water. And I go to the bathroom every hour or so uh, when I sleep. Uh, goes two times. So yeah, that used to happen to me all the time, too. It, it's the high protein. What happens is when you work out, um, especially you know intense training, uh, something called exercise-induced proteinuria occurs. What that means is that um, when your body is, is being pushed, you know, e exercise-wise in the gym, it allows your kidney tubules to be more permeable to allow amino acids to pass through. So what you'll notice is you're getting your, you'll get protein in your urine. It doesn't mean your kidneys are damaged. It's just, it's just your kidneys becoming more permeable and letting the protein out. And when you get protein in your urine, it has a diuresis effect on the body. It actually pulls fluid out of your body. So if you're leaking protein into your urine, you're also leaking urine into your urine, and, and so you're gonna pee a lot more frequently. Plus, I noticed at least when I was competing and when I was training heavy and, and doing, you know, eating a lot of food, at night was when my body detoxified itself. So by the end of the day, I could have been 10 or 12 pounds heavier than I was in the morning. Overnight, I would pee all that out and I would be down 10 or 12 pounds in the morning. So that's a normal cycle you know, of, 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 of a bodybuilder, so to speak. When you eat a lot of food and you train heavy, okay, you're gonna detoxify your body. Your body's gonna get rid of you know, uh, proteins that have been damaged and stuff like that. That's part of the game. Since I stopped doing the, the nutty training and eating as much protein, I, you know, I, I don't pee a lot unless I drink a lot before bed. you know. But I, I go a normal amount. Of, maybe I get up once to go to the bathroom, which is amazing because it was driving me nuts for a while. I was getting up like 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 the guy was saying. I wasn't getting up every hour, but I was getting up every two hours for sure. So I'm going to follow that because we're actually getting a lot of eating questions and particularly, I guess, nighttime uh, eating questions. So Gilad Ron, how important is it to eat before bed? I tend to eat the bulk of my meals during the day and eat very light on the last two, three hours before bed. It depends what you're trying to accomplish. If, you, if you're on a diet and trying to lose weight, then you really don't want to gorge yourself before bed. But you know, when I was you know, trying to gain muscle, I would eat, literally, I could eat dinner at like 10 o'clock at night and then go to bed at 11, and before I went to bed, I would drink another shake. Okay, I would have like a 50 grams of whey ice or something like that, or maybe more, you know, with some carbs or some fat, usually fat and protein. I would drink that before bed, and then I would wake up you know, to pee at two in the morning, and I would have a shake ready, and I would drink that down, like to replace what I just peed out, I don't know, and then I would go back to bed. As a matter of fact, there was some points uh, during the night, 
when I was at my biggest where I was doing it twice a night. I was drinking you know, two shakes in the middle of the night. Obviously, when you start doing that, you're gonna start, you're gonna be getting up a lot to pee. But it worked, I grew a lot, so you know. Most people don't need that much food, that's the case. But if you happen to have a fast metabolism and you notice that that's the case for you, shakes at night really do help. Really good one here from tavalary 3 d I'm sure you've gotten this question from a lot of your clients. If a client gets last place in a show but looked their absolute best, what would be the next step? Do the same type of prep, just add more size in the off season, feel like sometimes, I guess, they may just not have gotten the right judging in place. What do you do if one of your clients looks their absolute best, but you know, what are the next steps after a disappointing finish? Well. You know, how you place necessarily doesn't really always reflect how you looked. Because if you were like overweight or you, you know, you really looked terrible and then you really dieted your ass off and you got yourself in shape, you show up, you're in the best shape of your life, everyone's complimenting you, but the class is just really difficult and you happen to finish last, you know, maybe six out of six guys, but everyone ahead of you was really good. Then I pat the guy in the back, I said, Congratulations, man, you did great. All right, now we go back to the drawing board and we work on what we got to work on, which is usually means you probably don't have enough size or something like that. Because if your conditioning was good, you looked your best, you had good tan, good presentation, you got to put more muscle on. That's what bodybuilding is. It's a journey. I've helped people who look terrible, not because of me. Maybe they came to me, you know, four weeks out, and and or the, whatever the case may be, they weren't following the diet. Uh, we would try to play last minute catch up, and they looked terrible. And you know what? They've actually won their class because there was only four guys in the class. And the other three were not conditioned either. This guy had good shape. He won by default. And he probably shouldn't have won. So I, I, I yell at those people. I'm like, you know, don't, don't think you, got, you did good here. You got lucky. You know, of course, he's still gloating because, you know, in his mind, he's rationalizing, I did look good. You know, but that just goes to show you some people have really good genetic potential. They can win something despite the fact that they're not they're at their best. Hopefully, they use that as a motivation to get themselves to their best so they can beat the best guys in the world. So if you don't have a good, if you have a client who's, who you did their, the work for them, they put that, you know, the, they follow what you said and put the work in and they got themselves in the best shape of their life, you congratulate the heck out of them. Let's go to Ancient Mason 84. How would you go about cutting water with only diuretic foods? So I guess the best foods to cut water. I, you know, I don't believe in the whole diuretic, you know, food thing and eating asparagus. And look, if you got to lose water, okay, you can do it two, one of two ways. You could either stop drinking, okay, whether it be 24 hours before, 18 hours before, and let your body just naturally dehydrate, or you can take a diuretic, you know, to help facilitate that. The prescription diuretics are stronger, okay. The herbal ones are a little weaker. They all work. If you combine that with restricted drinking. Guess what? You're going to dry out. That's just the way it is. You know, everyone requires different things. If you're on anabolic steroids and some GH, you're probably going to be benefit from using a prescription diuretic. It's a little faster. It's more predictable. Um, if if you're not, if you're a natural competitor, then you can go out and buy some Uva Ursi and use 800 milligrams. You know, with every meal the day before your show, and you're going to look great too. It, it, it's the same effect. Let's go to Reds55 Radke. I think he has a couple of questions. The first one about CBD. Will CBD make you pop a drug test at work that tests for marijuana? If yes, is there a specific strain or variety of CBD that is safe to take so you don't get dinged? Most CBD should be certified you know, uh, free of THC. So if you fail a drug test, I would be very angry at the company making your CBD. The CBD should be THC, which is the drug that's in marijuana, free, even though it does contain hemp. Okay, that's not what it's illegal. It's the THC in the marijuana that's illegal. So you should be fine. Let's go to Rodman Richard. What's the longest cardio duration you've ever prescribed for a client during contest prep? I've had people do four hours a day for, the, for a couple days because they were so far behind. That, you know, we were just, they were like, I'll do anything. Um, true story, when I was uh, dating Colette Nelson, she was so far behind, I told her to do four hours of cardio, and she actually walked to the gym, which was like eight miles or something like that. And then, and she was, it was like blisteringly hot out, and I think someone, she had to get like a, like a ride on the way home because it was like she almost passed out. So if you're doing that much cardio, you know, three hours or above, 
you, you got to do it in a controlled air conditioned or heated environment. So if anything, you know, if you, if you feel lightheaded, you're going to pass out, at least you're right near you know, other people so you can be helped. Uh, it's not something I recommend you do and it's not something you would do routinely unless you really fell behind or you were you know, starting your prep very late. Let's go to Rob Rich 55. Dave, I often see the Titan Medical commercial before. Ask Dave. I was looking around some of their products. I saw one, Nectar of Gods. Uh, can you tell me a little, a little bit more about it? You know, they have a, a lot of great vitamin, injectable vitamin formulas at, at Titan. And, I, and, I, and I, you know, everyone knows I really like their products a lot. I like the fact that they're all made in American pharmacies. They're compounded, they're sent right to your house with a prescription. I don't have to worry. I use their injectable glutathione every single day. Every day, I take 200 milligrams of it. And I feel great on it. You know, I feel good. I don't get sick really. Um, aside from this nasty cough, this, I have an annoying cough that's driving me crazy. It's probably driving everyone here at work crazy too. But um, buy it, but I'm not, I don't feel sick. So it's a great formula. They have this nectar of the gods, which is very similar. It's glutathione with N acetylcysteine, which is another antioxidant that's actually a precursor to glutathione. It contains glutamine and proline and L injectable L carnitine. It's all, it's like a cocktail in one. Um, I'm going to start using that because I'm going to see if I, I notice any difference with the addition of some of these other ingredients, believe it or not. Um, they've been, I think they have a deal going on right now on the Nectar of the Gods. So if you actually contact TitanMedicalCenter.com, whether it be through email or you call them up, mention Dave Palumbo, mention RX Muscle for a discount because they will give you a discount. And I'm telling you, these are, they're great to try. And it's not something you have to take all the time. You could take it for a month here, take off two months, do another month. It's good for detoxification. It's good for just feeling good, you know, healthy liver, healthy, you know, cell function. Let's go to Shad Water Fit. If you had someone running two to four IU's growth hormone <laughs> during contest prep, do you normally have them run it all the way to the contest day or pull out at some point before? I uh, know some people get concerned about uh, water retention. Yeah, I haven't seen too many people that have water retention issues. Now, what I noticed when I was competing and I was on GH is my, my ab midsection would get sometimes distended a little bit. So what I would do is I would stop the growth hormone two weeks out. But then two days before the competition, I would put it back in. Because in two days, it will fill out your muscles and round them off, but it won't mess with your intestinal tract. It won't like bloat your stomach and won't give you excessive water retention. So that's how I did it. But most of my clients, believe it or not, who are on GH, I just leave them on GH right to the day of the show because they don't have any abdominal distension issues. Their midsection looks good and it's keeping them nice and round. Let's go to Glenner Dude. How do you come back from nerve damage? Talks about he had an epidural and a messed up part of his lower back and glute area. Nerve, don't, nerves in general don't regenerate very readily. Uh, it, Unfortunately, it's a, it's a subject that they just haven't figured out yet. Now, if you had a little bit of nerve damage from a needle, you know, from the epidural hitting something, um, a lot of times that will regenerate, but it could take three to six months, um, in which case, you know, some people have suggested that GH or IGF-1 helps with nerve regeneration. That's, you know, that's controversial, but it might work. It, it can't hurt. You know, the problem is that the way the nerves usually come back is that you do repetitive motions with that muscle, okay, that's gonna reestablish these nerve pathways and help these nerves grow into the right grooves so that they, they can accomplish what we we're looking for. Remember, the nerves are what tell the muscles contract. The muscles just don't do that on their own. They, they need, the, they need the, the, uh, the nervous system to tell them what to do. So, you know, when nerves are not firing well, okay, or they're damaged, that's not gonna allow the muscles to work well. And so they, they go hand in hand. You have nerve damage, you get muscle atrophy. Unfortunately, that's e the way it goes. Sorry. Uh, let's go to ERY Truth for mass gaining. Steady, consistent carbs or carb cycling? Everyone's different. I, I, in an off season, I like steady carbs, but if I have a person who's got a weird metabolism, I might vary the carbs from day to day. It really depends on who the person is. I, I was always a creature of habit. I was always very consistent during the week. And then on the weekends, I would give myself one cheat meal usually on, on the weekend. And that would throw like a monkey wrench into my metabolism kind of acclimating because I was changing things up like that. Big Ant 1026, Dave, why are bodybuilders eating so much white bread these days? Back in the day, we hardly ever ate bread. 
Um, and even if we did, it was wheat or rye. They eat white bread because it tastes good. I mean, let's face it. Why do you eat a hamburger roll? Because it tastes good, right? I don't know. I, I'm not a big, you know, I only eat bread if I go to the Italian restaurant. If I go to like Carrabba's or some other Italian restaurant and they bring out a, 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 bowl, a basket of bread, I'm Italian. That's what we do. We eat bread. So I just do it to be social. But I wouldn't get a bag of Wonder Bread and start making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for myself. That's just crazy horrible. I think the breads that they bake in the ovens are, are way healthier. Or I could be deceiving myself. Now there's like Ezekiel bread. That seems to be, and these, these, these sprout breads that are much, much better. You got to read your ingredient list. If there's 4,000 ingredients on the ingredient list, it's probably not something you should be putting in your body on a regular basis. However, if you go out to eat once in a, in a while, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, and you want to have some bread at, at the Italian restaurant, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be restricting myself unless you're on a strict contest diet. You know, that, I mean, it's just intuitive. How good is your metabolism? What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? You trying to lose weight? Don't eat bread. You trying to gain weight? Then, then you can have some bread. It's that simple. Let's go to the atomic beast. Why is it such a common issue, even in the pro ranks, for competitors' legs to not be up to par with their upper body? Is it an age issue, injuries, or are people just not training them as hard? I think all of the above. I think that there's a, it's a combination. Some people are lazy. Some people don't train hard. Some people train too much. You know, that, and, and sometimes people just don't have good leg genetics. If you don't have a good leg genetics and you overtrain your legs, you're never going to build good legs. You know? But there's a lot of guys out there with great legs because they train hard and they know how to eat and they know how to, they know how to work the, themselves. And they're not afraid to go into that discomfort zone and take the time and put the muscle on. Adam James Cooper is injectable L-carnitine, good for fat loss. Also, does Yohimbe really work on stubborn fatty areas due to being a good or due to being an alpha-2 receptor blocker? L-carnitine injectable will only burn fat, you know, efficiently if you're really kind of deficient in L-carnitine. L-carnitine is the transport that transports plants or transports long-chain fats into the mitochondria of the muscle cell where they're then oxidized for fuel. So theoretically, if you put more uh, L-carnitine into the body, you'll give the body the ability to, 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 to oxidize more fats, you know. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily hold true because if you have enough already, it's not gonna really do much more. I think the first initial dosages do do something, then after a while, overkill, you know, sets in and people are like, oh, I'll just do more, 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 more. No. It's funny that the person asked this question because we just had the question earlier about the Titan, uh, what was it called? Uh, nectar of Gods. Nectar of the Gods form, right. So that's something that has injectable uh, L-carnitine. It. So you can, that's something I would use because then you can say, all right, I'm using this, but it's already got all the other stuff I really want. It's got the glutamine and acetylcysteine too. So if I take it, at least I'm not wasting my time. Uh, final question from Billy G. Fit. Dave, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention uh, the good news you and your family have coming, of course, everyone is aware, you and Amanda are expecting your third child. Um, Dave, my wife is about to have a baby. Um, any tips on being a new father while maintaining the bodybuilding lifestyle? So I guess this is someone who's competing right now uh, and about to enter the realm of fatherhood. Yeah, you're in big trouble, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Your wife will never be happy. You'll never do enough. And uh, the best thing I can say is happy wife, happy life. So, you know, the first six weeks at least, six to eight weeks, I would try to help her as much as possible because, you know, she's probably going to want to do everything herself anyway because, you know, mothers want to, you know, control the baby. But at least offer and be there, you know, try to get up. If you, if you get up once a night when the baby cries, that, that's at least showing them that you're, that you're interested in what's going on. Um, you know, it, it, it's tough. Men, men are not by nature, you know, nurturers and caregivers. I love my kids and I love to spend time with them. And when they got to like two years old, I think they were the coolest. That's when I really loved spending time with them. And I enjoy changing. I don't really mind changing diapers and stuff like that. But it's like you never could do enough because the mother will always do a little bit more because that's, you know, she birthed the kid, you know, and she's got to nurse the kid and she's got to, you know, do this and that for the kids. So, you're, you're basically a support system. <laughs> you're like the, you know when, when the auto, when the cars you know, race, they pull into the pit crew and the pit crew changes the tires? That's what you are, you're the pit crew. You're not, you're not the driver of the car, you're the pit crew. Remember that, if you know your place as the pit crew and not the driver of the car, 
you'll get along very well and your wife will be very happy. Pit crew's always got to be ready to go because if that car pulls in and you're not there to change those tires, you're going to get yelled at. That's my advice. <laughs> <laughs> And on that note, that's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave again, brought to you by Species Nutrition, Titan Medical Center, and the Chicken Pound. Click below for the Jay Cutler Part 2 interview. Jay Cutler talks about this upcoming 2019 Olympia business and everything else going on in Jay Cutler's busy yet very, very interesting life. For Dave Palumbo and Tyler Shore, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.